Welcome back. Now we are going to focus on lecture 28 and we are going to talk about phase transitions. We already discussed phase transitions in a, a couple of uh, lectures ago when we, we found that uh, the Van der Waals uh, description of a gas, so when we include in the attraction and repulsion, that particular model allowed uh, for uh, the coexistence of two phases. So remember we had two different value, value of the volumes that was allowed uh, uh, for a given pressure. And these two volumes basically corresponded to two different phases. And we already discussed that uh, at, to, to some extent in a, in a previous uh, uh, screencast. Today, we are going to spend an entire screencast to look uh, uh, much deeper into this problem of phase transitions. And we will quantify and qualify uh, those different phase transitions and go much beyond what we've done uh, before in the previous, uh, in the previous lectures. Uh, you will see that this particular screencast is going to be a blend of um, many things that we have done uh, so far. And so many equations are going to come back that we have introduced in the previous screencast. I've tried to, to emphasize uh, them and put them in some uh, boxes uh, to, to remind you of equations, but it's probably not a good idea to start a discourse with this lecture. You should probably start a little bit earlier than, than lecture 28. Um, one thing that I would like to say uh, before I actually start with the, the, the material that I want to introduce to you in this, in, in, in this uh, presentation is that exceptionally, I have decided to divide this screencast into two parts and the part on the Ising model and the uh, Monte Carlo uh, algorithm will be uh, provided as a separate screencast as it is a, a computational approach that can be used to illustrate everything that we are going to do um, today. So let's try to, to go back to what we discussed about, about uh, the phase transition of a liquid into a vapor. Uh, so we saw that, of course, if you want to increase the temperature of a substance, you need to provide heat. So you need to transfer heat into the system. You also know that if you provide heat into a system, you are increasing its, its entropy by definition. Now let's go back a little bit to the first law of thermodynamics, du equal TdS minus PdV. Uh, we've introduced the definition of the heat capacity uh, at constant volume, Cv, which is uh, the partial derivative of the internal energy with respect to temperature at constant volume. And uh, we also saw uh, that we can uh, rewrite this, uh, uh, in fact, using uh, the, the top equation, the, the right, using this equation here, we can also write Cv is equal to the, the, the isochoric uh, variation of entropy with respect to temperature. So this is something that's, that's important. It means that the, this measure here of uh, heat capacity, for example, a constant volume, but could be at other other constraint is related to the change of entropy with respect to temperature. And in fact, in general, we can write that the heat capacity under a constraint X can be written this way. So this is coming directly from the first law of thermodynamics. And in fact, the second law of thermodynamics as well, this is how we could replace the heat transfer, uh, the re reversible heat um, transferred by, by this term. So that's good. So this is what we have. Um, now, if we look at this plot that we've seen in lecture 26, we saw that uh, below the critical point here, we have the coexistence of the, of the liquid uh, and gas. Uh, and then at this point, starting at this point, we have uh, the two phase in equilibrium, okay? So it turns out that the two phases are equilibrium on, on, this, uh, on this curve right here that we are going to discuss much more. Well, it turns out that in order for a system to go from the liquid to the gas, so once you have heated it up to the level to reach this, this curve, the additional heat that you need to provide is called the latent heat. So the latent heat is the additional heat you need to, to be, needs to be transferred to change from phase one to phase two. And uh, so just to, to be clear, you need to transfer heat to, to heat up the liquid and once you get into uh, the point of equilibrium between the liquid and the gas, you need to add additional heat to transform the liquid into the gas. And that additional heat is called the latent heat. Uh, this is not 
uh, face, the fa this is very usual to you have this additional heat that has to be applied, it has to be transferred to, to change uh, from a face to, other, to another, but this is not always the case. This is very often the case, and we are going to see the condition under which this is true. So the latent heat, we are going to call it L, is this, this heat transfer that we need to move from one phase to the other. And of course, from the definition, we find that the, this, the, at least if, if we do this reversibly, this heat transfer is going to be equal to T dL, 2 delta S. Okay, temperature, of course, we are working at the, we are working here at the, at the, at the critical point. So, and S2 and S1 are the two, at the entropy of the two phases that we are looking at. So basically, what it, this is a very important result is that because uh, we have the a latent heat that has to be applied uh, at a given temperature, that means that we must have a discontinuity in the entropy, right? Because um, adding heat corresponds to a, to a change in entropy, and so since we have a sudden addition of, of heat, to, to move from one phase to the other, that corresponds also to a discontinuity in the entropy. Uh, even further than this, if we have a discontinuity in the entropy, then the derivative of the entropy at the critical temperature will be a spike. And we are going to see example of that a little bit later. So it turns out, and I'm, I'm already giving you information that will come later in this screencast, it turns out this is called the first order uh, phase transition uh, because uh, we have a discontinuity uh, that's related to the to, to the to heat here, but we are going to discuss that in, in more detail. My, my point, though, is that not all phase transitions will correspond to a change uh, in entropy like this. But this kind of uh, particular case, going from a liquid to a gas, uh, is is actually a situation where we have a discontinuous change in entropy. And this is not very surprising, as of course the entropy or disorder or number of microstates increased suddenly between a gas and a liquid. So there are many more microstates in a gas than there will be in a liquid, and that's what accounts for the jump uh, in in entropy uh, when you have a phase change. So this is basically what this screencast will be all about. Will be about describing what I just discussed to you and and and, and justifying this. So this is the example we have. If we look at the entropy as a function of temperature, we find that you need some heat to warm up the water. And then you are going, and so when I see heat because the, uh, transferring heat increases the entropy. And then because you, you want to have a phase change here, you need a, a latent heat, which is given right here. And of course, uh, we end up, uh, of course, it's we have, this is, since the, the y-axis is entropy, this is not directly the heat, but if you take the heat divided by the temperature, you get the, you get the change in entropy. And of course, after that, you get, you get the vapor or steam, that which is also for which the entropy also goes up with temperature. So this is a discontinuous, uh, we have a discontinuity in entropy. In fact, we can calculate uh, uh, the amount of, of heat that we, can, that we need to, to, to add and you can see that the fact that you have a discontinuity means that um, the, the, the slope basically here is going to give you the heat. So this is just the example that we got from the book, that if it takes three minutes to boil water from 20 degrees here to the, to the, to the boiling temperature, so here, uh, this is the boiling temperature, Tb, um, uh, if, we need, need, uh, if we need to do that, uh, how much... Uh, heat, so how, what's the amount of latent heat you have to provide to this particular body of water to completely transform it into steam, and of course we just, we just have to, we can just calculate, uh, we can just calculate this uh, by looking at the tables that tells us that the heat capacity for water is 4.2 um, uh, joule per Kelvin, and uh, the energy, uh, the latent heat is actually much, much larger here, megajoule per kilogram. So we can we you can you can calculate all this and find and find of course uh, some numbers that allow you to see that the latent heat is actually a fairly large number in this case. So this discontinuity is real. Okay, so let's try to look a little bit more in detail about this entropy discontinuity. And uh, I remind you of this important equation which defines the latent heat. Uh, it's going to come in handy. 
it's a very important relationship because it relates the latent heat with the change in entropy at the critical temperature. So let's try to go back to this uh, statistical uh, description of entropy, which is related to the logarithm of the number of microstates in the part for a particular system. The number of microstates available for a, ga a single gas molecule is obviously proportional to its volume. How do you convince yourself of that? Well, the larger the volume, the more state a gas molecule can occupy. Okay. Remember that we find uh, in a previous uh, lecture, in fact, I think we've seen that probably half a dozen times by now, that the volume in K space, for example, in reciprocal space occupied by a, by a gas molecule is related to uh, one, over the, uh, one over the volume, okay? So that means that the number of states that a gas molecule can occupy is proportional to the volume. Uh, good. So that means that if I want to look at the ratio between the number of microstates in the vapor phase and in the liquid phase, we find that is related to the ratio between the vapor volume of vapor phase divided by the liquid phase. And the reason why we have this 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 uh, this term is because the number of microstates is directly proportional to the number of the, to the volume. Now we have n a because. Uh, this, the fact, the number of microstates is, of course, for single gas molecule. Now, if we want to look at this for 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 more of molecules, we can actually, of course, uh, multiply uh, this ratio uh, as many times as I have a molecule. So that means that I have the power n a here. So, uh, of course, I can also write that the same term is actually equal to the ratio between the density of liquid and density of vapor. The reason being the, 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 these densities are related, of course, to the inverse of the volume. And in most liquid uh, comparison of liquid to vapor, the density goes, is about, about a factor of 1,000. That's about true for, for water, for example. And so we end up with the fact that the ratio between the number of microstates in the vapor phase and the liquid phase is 10 to the power 3 to, to, to the power 3 NA, basically, NA being the Avogadro number. So, there are, so the entropy in the vapor phase is much larger in the liquid. So we can calculate that entropy, that change in entropy, uh, and the change in entropy will be, of course, uh, taking advantage of the properties of the logarithm. So the difference in logarithm is the logarithm logarithm of the of the of the quotient between the two, so uh, the ratio between the two. And so we, we end up with uh, for, for a mole of of, uh, of gas, so a mole of, of of, of molecule of gas, we find that this term, this change of entropy is about 7R, R being the constant of gas. So this is nice because if I go back now to the definition of the latency of, of the latent heat, uh, I find that the latent heat is equal to 7RTB, right? I just, because I just calculated delta S. This is called tr uh, Troughton's rule. It's an empirical rule that uh, that's actually, um, I mean, that's obeyed for many, many, many gas uh, systems. In fact, uh, this calculation here uh, was based off a very simple model. If we do something a little bit more um, accurate, we find that the latent heat is actually related to 10 RTB. It's a little bit larger. Uh, it's a bit larger because it turns out that this particular description does not include the interaction between the gas molecule right here we just multiplied uh, instead of taking a fact that there were other molecules already present so the fact that there is an attraction means that you need more heat more latent heat to to dissociate the um, the, the component the molecules in the gas in the liquid into a gas so you need a little bit more heat to basically um, break the attractive interaction. So it's the reason why actually in general it's more like a factor of 10 instead of a factor of 7. But the idea is the same. So we can have a look at a number of examples of this. Uh, that's also a good idea to remind us about the law of corresponding states. The law of corresponding states basically says that we are using a similar uh, description to understand what's going on in, in the system and, um, and in the problems. And so uh, we have a number of, of uh, constant that are specific to to the to the to the particular molecules you are looking at. So in this case, for example, the latent uh, 
heat and the, the boiling temperature. But because we have a universal description of what's happening, you know, the, using, for example, uh, the ideal gas law or the Van der Waals uh, model, uh, we can basically, if we were, use reduced coordinates, uh, we end up with we end up with something that's, that's, that can be compared between the different systems. It's something we discussed quite a bit a couple of lectures ago. So in any case, what we do is that if we define, define L by RTB, we should have about 10. And for this model, which is pretty rough, we find that it's almost 10 everywhere uh, with some exceptions, either a very low number or much larger number. And these exceptions can be explained by the fact that we have uh, either strong quantum mechanical effect or strong effect, structural effect that we have not in, uh, included in the system. So basically the idea here is that it's pretty good description to say that the latent heat is proportional to the boiling temperature. For, uh, and this is related to the change of, in entropy. Okay, now what's happening during a phase transition? We already discussed that we need to apply heat in some cases, in the case that we saw for the, the transition from a liquid to a vapor. Now, what happens about the uh, with the chemical potential? Remember, we've discussed quite a bit about the chemical potential. Uh, we discussed that uh, if we work at constant pressure and temperature, like chemists usually do, uh, this is the Gibbs function that we need to include, right? Because the natural variable are pressure and temperature. And of course, if we have a, va uh, a varying number of of uh, of particle in different phases, we also need to add the term here that we included when we studied the chemical uh, potential. Very good. Um, okay, so the Gibbs function uh, is the chemical potential per particle. So that's, an, that's a very important thing that we have to, to remember this. Uh, this is something I've discussed a lot, and then we are going to use that a number of times in this screencast, is that the Gibbs function is the chemical potential per particle. So that means that if we have n1 particle in phase one and n2 particle in phase two, we find that the, 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 the Gibbs function is the chemical potential per particle. But here, since we have two types of particles, right, different phases, we have this weighted average for the, the Gibbs function. So now we can go back here and we know that uh, because we are working at constant pressure and constant temperature, uh, at equilibrium, uh, we know that this sum here is going to be equal to zero, right? So dn1 mu1 plus dn2 mu2 is equal, going to be equal to zero. And uh, since the number, there is no chemical reaction here, it's just a phase going from a liquid to a gas, let's say, or gas to liquid. So that means that each time I lose one particle of gas, I gain one particle of liquid. So in other words, dn1 is equal to minus dn2, which basically says that mu1 has to be equal to mu2. So during a phase transition, the chemical potential of the two phases have to be equal. Uh, this is not really surprising because, uh, uh, as we know, uh, a reaction or uh, a process will always take place to get the minimum value <clears throat> of the chemical potential. So of course, when one changes changes to the other, uh, they have and if they coexist, they have to be the same. Otherwise, they would not coexist. So during a phase transition, the chemical potential of the two phases are the same. So I'd like to, to just say two things that are important on this, on this, uh, on this slide. Uh, the first one is this, of course, that the chemical potential is the same uh, between the two phases during the phase transition. That's what we described. But also a reminder of something that we've seen before and we will, it's really crucial, is that the Gibbs function is the chemical potential per particle. We are going to use that quite a few times. Now let's try to go one step further and try to understand this, this curve, this coexistence curve between the two, <clears throat> the two phases. And we are going to again plot this as a, uh, in, a, in, a phase, in a phase diagram, as we call it, where we have the temperature in the x-axis and the pressure on the y-axis. And the question is, what's the phase boundary between the, in the, in the pressure temperature plane? So, how do we describe this, this line here where the two phases coexist? Let's do it. First of all, we know that that line is described by the chemical potential of the two phases being equal. That's what we've done in the previous slide. That means that if I make changes of pressure and temperature, so if I move along this line, along the temperature line and the pressure line, 
uh, the temperature axis and pressure axis, sorry, we still have the two chemical potential have to be equal along this along this curve here. So this is what's mean, meant here. In other words, the change in chemical potential of one phase has to be equal to the change in chemical potential in the other phase. So not only the chemical potential is the same, but it changes continuously between the two. Now we have to remember that uh, we can we can can write this uh, this way, okay, and uh, on the on uh, certainly on uh, uh, along along this line here, uh, and then we, of course, as I said before, the Gibbs fun uh, the, the chemical potential is a Gibbs function per particle, and if we use all this pro all that information, we can use that information to find that the change in chemical potential, so d, d mu is simply going to be equal to minus n over n dt plus v over n dp. This is, there is no mystery here. I simply divided uh, 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 these two, the left and the right hand side of this equation by n. So I ended up with dg over n, which is d mu, and minus n s over n dt plus v over n dp. So that's all I did. Now I can write, n is the number of particles. I can rewrite this so that I have the entropy per particle on both sides, okay? Uh, because d mu one is equal to d mu two, so I can, d mu one is gonna be equal to this on the left-hand side, and it's gonna be equal to this on the right-hand side. So sm uh, lowercase s is the entropy per particle, and, and lowercase v is the volume per particle. So we, I can write this this way here. I can rearrange, of course, very easily, to bring dp over dt, and I find the dp over dt, so the, the slope of this curve, basically, is going to be equal to the change of entropy divided by the change of volume between the two phases. It's a very important result, of course. Uh, but we are not there, we are, we, are, we are going to reuse this, but there is something more that we can do. Let's try to remember, again, this definition of the latent heat, okay, which is the temperature, the critical point is multiplied by by the change in entropy. Uh, I can combine these two results, like here, to write the dp over dt is going to be simply, we're going to replace s2 minus s1 by L over t, so L over t. And here I have a no, lowercase l, which is the latent heat per particle, okay? Now I can now go back into working, uh, multiply by, by n across the system and I end up with dp over dt is going to be L over t v2 minus v1. This is a very important result. It provides you an idea, it gives you actually exactly what is the, the slope, so the, the variation of this phase boundary, okay, as a function of latent heat, temperature, and change in volume. So that is crucial to describe the, uh, the boundary between the two phases. This is close close use Clapeyron um, equation, and this is a very uh, it is a very important uh, very important one. So we can apply this equation here uh, in a in a in a simple system uh, that we can we can uh, we can uh, we can use. Uh, we are we are going to reuse the equation from the close use uh, Clapeyron uh, equation, which is reproduced here. Uh, we are going to suppose the latent heat does not depend on temperature, which turns out not to be true. The latent heat does change, on, uh, it does vary with temperature, but we are going to imagine that in the in the range we are working at, it, it, it will, we will uh, ignore that. We are going to suppose that the gas can be treated as an ideal gas, and we are going to suppose that the change in volume is is very large. It's so large that V2 minus V1 is basically equal to V2 is equal to the volume of the gas. So that we are going to basically ignore the correction of the fact because the gas takes so much more space than the liquid. So when I do that, I end up with L over TV and I can replace V by, uh, by RT over P because it's an ideal gas. So I end up with this equation right here. Of course, it's an equation that's pretty easy to integrate. So I can rewrite it this way. I'm going to have a logarithm here. I'm going to have a, a power here. And of course, if I have a logarithm here, power here, I end up with an, expo an exponential for the pressure. So basically that means that the pressure on this, so this is the pressure on the, on the, the graph that I showed you on the previous slide, 
we can look at the pressure as a function of temperature, which is which is basically an exponential here. P0 is defined, uh, it's, it was a constant of integration, it is defined as the pressure when the temperature is, is infinite, basically. Okay, nice. Now, we just discussed gas and liquid boundary and closes Clapeyron, Clapeyron, but we can actually go move, move beyond this and think about the liquid and solid. So this is a phase diagram what we, we, we expanded uh, at a lower temperature. And when we go to lower temperature, there is a possibility to create a solid. In fact, if you see here, and uh, if you go uh, really low uh, in, uh, if you if you go really low in 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 the in in pressure in in, in temperature and, and even high, and especially high pressure, you start to see that you have a possibility to create a, a, a solid. And in fact, you have a phase transition between a solid and a liquid. But you could also have a phase transition between the gas and the solid under the triple point. Triple point is that point where the three phases coexist, and we are going to describe that a little bit more. So let's try, go back to the clausius clapeyron equation, which is here, and which I, of course, can write this way. This is the same thing. There's no, nothing special. And I can, uh, again, uh, if we suppose the, the uh, latent heat is not, uh, does not depend on temperature, we can, we can write this uh, this way here. Now, uh, because we are looking at between the liquid and solid, I don't use the ideal gas law, of course, here yeah, I cannot do that, uh, simply because uh, there is no gas. Uh, so P0 and T0 are going to be um, constant of integration. What we need to make sure is that this point P0, T0 correspond to a point in this, in this particular phase diagram that correspond to the, to the phase transition that we are interested in. Now, here's the thing. The difference in volume, the change in volume between a solid and a liquid is actually pretty small. There's no much difference between in, 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 uh, in size between liquid and solid as opposed to a gas, for example. The volume of a gas is much larger than the volume of a liquid or in a solid at constant, you know, at constant, uh, at a given pressure or given temperature. Here, delta V is pretty small. So that's, uh, that means that, uh, the, the, that that's the reason why uh, because delta V is so small, uh, we see that the slope of this curve, P as a function of temperature, is going to be very, very, very sharp. So the pressure shoots up very quickly for very small variation of temperature. That's what it means. And this, is come from, this comes from the fact that delta V is so small. So delta V being so small means that this term here is very, 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 very large. So that means that the slope is very large. Uh, it turns out this slope is positive, and then we are going to discuss that in a second. But this, this, the, the slope is very steep and looks almost like a vertical line. And this is actually related to two things. First of all, it's related to delta V being so small, as I just discussed, but also L. Remember the L, the latent heat, is proportional to the change in entropy. And the change in entropy between a liquid and a solid is huge. Actually, the if I go from a solid to a liquid, we are increasing the entropy a lot. Remember the entropy being the number related to the number of microstates. There are many more microstates in a liquid, many more configurations than there is in a solid. So both terms, a large uh, entropy change and a small volume change, means that this term is extremely large, hence the vertical line here. Uh, one thing that's important to know is that there is no uh, th there is no critical point like there would be between the liquid and gas. If we are beyond the critical point, uh, we do not have a sharp uh, transition between the liquid and gas. But for the solid, there is nothing that changes it. So this curve, this line, basically keeps going forever. Uh, we find that there there is a way that those three points, that this point here in this phase diagram, is a point where we have. Uh, the triple point is a single point where the three phases coexist. And when we are very close to this point, the latent heat of sublimation, as you know, sublimation is to go from the solid to the liquid, uh, to, the, to the gas, sorry, is the sum of the latent heat to go from solid to liquid and to liquid to gas. How do you see this? Well, if I'm very, very close to this point here, and I go to the right, so going from here to here is going to request 
to require the latent heat from solid to liquid, and then moving forward is going to be the latent heat from liquid to gas. So basically, uh, and there is very little energy that I need here to heat up because it's such a small distance. So basically, to go from solid to gas will require the sum of solid to liquid to liquid to gas. That's what this sentence here means. Uh, let's try to have a look a little bit more at this particular curve. I just mentioned to you that this is a positive, no, positive slope. It's not clear that it's positive. It looks so, like a vertical slope. Uh, it's very, very, very large because, as I said, large change in entropy and small change in volume. Let's try to have a look a little bit more on this. So for this, what I did on this slide, I actually added a vertical line here to show that the slope is indeed positive. And then I realized when I did this that you can barely see this. So I zoomed in in here. So I actually almost use a, I have to use a microscope to see this. And then when you zoom in, you see that there is indeed a tiny, small uh, positive slope. So the positive slope means that then when a temperature increases, the pressure uh, increases uh, as well, like this. So it's a positive slope. And it's positive simply because the entropy uh, increases and the volume increases. Uh, when you go from a solid to a liquid, okay? So that's the idea. Now, it turns out not every, there are some exceptions and not every system, uh, and not every system has a, uh, has a, has a positive change in volume, okay? Some system do not have a positive change in volume. They actually shrinks, shrink when they become liquid. And this, there is one that's very well known, it's water. Turns out that for water, the change in volume when you go from a solid to a liquid is actually it going down. The solid takes more space than the liquid, at least the usual phase of water that we use. And this is translated into the negative slope. You see that the slope is actually negative. It's actually slightly going to the left, still pretty vertical because of what we discussed before, right? A, ch a large change, of, a tiny change of volume and fairly large change in, in, uh, in entropy. But the point remains that the reason why we have this is because of the crystal structure of water, which actually, uh, because of the hydrogen bond in water, uh, it turns out that the cage, the molecular cage in the solid water takes a little bit more space than, uh, than, than the arrangement in liquid. That's, that's just the way it, it works. So, so in that case, you see that a translation of that fact is seen in this uh, phase diagram where this uh, solid liquid uh, boundary uh, function is actually uh, a function going to the left, okay, slightly leaning to the left. That's what it means. And as I explained, it's due to the hydrogen bonding. So there are actually a, a lot of consequences on this, and and I invite you to to dig deeper into this problem. It turns out that uh, um, there are. Um, there are a number of articles that were a very interesting article that explained that without this effect, uh, there would be no life on Earth. Uh, and I'm going to explain to you why that is the case. First of all, and this is nothing to do with life on Earth maybe right away, but icebergs float on the ocean because, as I said, the, the, the solid phase is, uh, has a larger volume, therefore a smaller density. So smaller density means that they're going to float on the ocean. That's, we, that's fine. The second thing, and this is the important thing, is because of that, the, if, if you have a body of water, like an ocean or a lake that freezes, the, the lower density uh, phase is going to go up. So that's going to be, for example, ice. And the higher density um, phase is going to stay at the bottom of the ocean or the bottom of the lake. And it turns out that the lower, the higher density water is at four degrees centigrade. So that means that in a lake or uh, ocean, the bottom of the ocean is at four degrees centigrade, which is sufficient temperature to preserve life. So that means that um, uh, imagine for a second if the ocean or the lake was both or either of them were freezing from the bottom. Uh, that means that uh, uh, the animal could not feed at the bottom, could not probably survive, and uh, that would be. Uh, basically no possibility of, of life, of development of life. And finally, there's something that's, that you probably have uh, uh, already experienced in your daily life. Uh, pressing uh, an eye, pressing ice can cause it to melt. So if you increase the temperature, uh, 
the the temperature if you increase the pressure sorry the temperature at which the 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 the, the phase transition happens goes down so basically that means that if you work at a given temperature pressing on ice can melt it and of course you know this and you've probably seen the experiment where you use a, a thin uh, a wire and then if you press the wire on an ice cube and the wire is going to penetrate the ice cube uh, simply because the pressure makes it melt and then actually you can you can cut i mean you can actually go through the ice cube but you usually don't cut because it's reform in the back but there are many examples of of that of that effect so now we can ask a question about the stability and meta stability and and this is something we already uh, uh, discussed when we introduced uh, the gibbs uh, uh, function a couple of slides ago, but I'm I'm going to revisit this completely from scratch. So first of all, let's try to re let's try to remember that uh, we can write these two equations here that are very important. The first th these two equations have already been written a couple of slides ago, but let me remind you so that's so important. We know that the right hand side of this equation here is just the change in the Gibbs function. We also know the chemical potential uh, is nothing else than the Gibbs function divided by n. Right per per particle. So basically, there's a reason why we can write this. Now, if we redefine the entropy per particle as as lowercase n and the volume per particle as lowercase v, we can write this. Okay. So that's nice. Now here's what's happening. Let's try to exp to understand how the chemical potential changes with pressure and how the chemical changes with temperature. And of course, the chemical potential of the vapor phase and the liquid liquid phase. Uh, both of them are going to change with pressure and temperature. And we know from uh, second law of thermodynamics that the system that will be the most stable will be the one that corresponds to the lower chemical potential. Okay, So always try to minimize the chemical potential. And of course, we also know that, um, that, that the, the, the two phases will coexist when the two chemical potentials are the same. So these, two, these points right here. Now let's try to understand a little bit how those graph works, how the, the slope of these graphs, so mu as a function of pressure and mu as a function of temperature, how they work. So this is a result I give you, uh, and now I'm going to justify it. So uh, we know the phase transition always takes place towards the, the lowest chemical potential. So that's, that's why we have the go from vapor to liquid here. And when we increase pressure, so it makes sense, we increase pressure, therefore we have a liquid. We increase temperature, we go from liquid to vapor. So that's fine. Now here's, the, here's what, what we can also write. And this is coming directly from this equation. It's a very important result. We are going to reuse it a couple of times in this screencast. And this is how the chemical potential uh, vary with pressure. Well, we can use this, this exact differential and see the two natural variable T and P. And so of course we know that the, the uh, partial derivative of mu with respect to pressure at constant temperature is simply going to be given by the reduced volume right here. When I say reduced volume, I mean the volume per particle. So that means that this, this uh, a number of things can be understood. First of all, it means that the, the slope of the mu versus p uh, function is always going to be positive, of course, because the volume is a positive number. So we have those uh, graph, those, uh, those, those curves here are always a positive slope, so that's fine. So mu is a function of pressure. Second, what I can also see is that uh, at, at very, very large, uh, uh, very large pressure, for example, so at very large pressure, uh, we are going to find that the, the, the system that goes, uh, that, that's, that's, uh, that's the most stable is going to be the liquid, uh, and it corresponds to the smaller volume. Right, because this is going to be uh, what's happening. A smaller volume is more stable at high pressure. That makes sense. So smaller volume means that uh, this derivative is the smallest. So therefore, we we go. This is this is how you get to a lower chemical potential. So that's that's good, um, which makes sense, right? The smallest volume at high pressure, at least for this for for usual liquid uh, vapor uh, transition. Now we also know uh, using the same differential equation here that the partial derivative of the chemical potential mu with respect uh, to temperature at constant pressure um, is going to be equal to minus S, S being the entropy per particle. Remember that the entropy is a positive number. Uh, this, is, this is something that we've, def we've defined it that way. 
Uh, and um, remember, it's the logarithm of a num number of microstates. So number of microstates is always larger, uh, equal to one or larger to one than one. So it's always, so the logarithm is always positive. Uh, so we, 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 know, we know this. So that means that in a mu versus t uh, a graph, this um, uh, plot like this, uh, the, the, the slope is negative. And that is indeed what we see. Okay? We also know that uh, the slope is going to be related to, to the entropic uh, value. So we know that the, that means that the, the slope is going, to be, uh, is going to be more negative I would say for it's going to be more negative for the vapor phase compared to the liquid phase. Why? Because the entropy of the vapor phase is larger since there are many more microstates. So this is what's happening, and it's how I explain those all those graphs here. So that means that at high temperature, of course, the most stable is the highest entropy, which is uh, the vapor phase. So that also explains why at high temperature we have the vapor phase. So that's all all nice. So we can understand that uh, the transition between vapor and liquid is always so that the, we, the, the system adopts for a given pressure and temperature, the lowest uh, value of the chemical potential. That's good. So remember, we've seen this graph before, I believe, and this graph sees that, uh, this is the graph before, where we see those two branches that should not be um, the one that the system thermodynamically would, should adopt. This is, let's, let's try to, to, to have a look at one of them. So, so this, this graph is nothing else than one of the graph on the previous slides that I just, that I just zoomed in. Uh, let's look at the chemical potential as a function of temperature. Suppose that you have a liquid and a liquid that you heat up. You're going to heat up the liquid. The chemical potential is going to keep going down, as we expect. It's going to go down. Uh, why is it going down? Because it's minus the entropy. Okay, so the entropy actually... Uh, so this is why we have we have this this graph. It goes down. Um, now at this point, if we if there was no change into the vapor, it would keep going going. Uh, uh, chemical potential would keep going down. Okay, but the liquid would be would achieve a point here that is much ho ho uh, much hotter. So it should be superheated compared to the maximum it's supposed to uh, to attain. Indeed, why is there a maximum? Because the liquid would actually transform into vapor. So this green branch corresponds to the liquid which would be heated above its uh, boiling temperature, if you will. So it would be hotter than, it would still be a liquid, and it would have a higher temperature than, than the vapor phase. So this, this is not thermodynamically uh, accessible according to, to, to this description. Now we can have the same thing for the vapor. In fact, if you let's say you cool down vapor, you cool down vapor, and you know there would be a temperature which is which is of course the, the, the also the boiling temperature, where the system would actually move into a liquid if you keep going down in temperature. But it could also be that the vapor would keep going down in temperature along the same branch, uh, and it would be a super cool vapor. Uh, so the supercooled vapor is not the most stable phase at this temperature, and it's certainly not uh, what thermodynamics would predict. But maybe there are some conditions under which this is possible, at least for a certain amount of time, and this is called uh, a metastable situation. And in fact, this metastable situation is a short-lived situation that is that is possible. Uh, that's allowed by this graph, even though thermodynamics tells you that it should be a lower chemical potential. So and we are going to discuss why we can actually go on these two branches now. So uh, we're in fact going to describe this for a specific case of, uh, of the fo formation of droplets, so the condensation. Why uh, vapor can be a s go into supercooled vapor instead of creating a liquid. And this is something that's happening here, and this is related to fluctuations that we are going to describe uh, much more in details here. Good. So for to describe this, the fact that we could have a super cool, uh, a super cool uh, vapor, let's imagine that you have a liquid and vapor that are in equilibrium at uh, at certain at a given pressure. Of course, we know that the chemical potential of the liquid and vapor have to be equal. Uh, during this, during uh, equilibrium, during the phase transition, and 
if we if we increase the the pressure of the liquid, the pressure of the vapor will increase as well. Okay, uh, at during this this uh, this equilibrium phase. So let's try to translate this mathematically. So if we increase the liquid pressure by delta p liquid, okay, the chemical potential will have to change as well. And the way you calculate the change in chemical potential is by using a, a partial derivative. So the part, the change in the chemical potential of the liquid with respect to pressure times the change in pressure has to be equal to the change in chemical potential of vapor uh, with respect to pressure times the variation of pressure. This is simply from the fact that the chemical potential have to be uh, the same. This is just a, a, a multivariable calculus formulation. That means now that, and this is an important point that I, I brought your attention on, we know how to calculate this term. This is related to the volume. And if you don't remember, just go back a couple of slides ago. This is the volume of the liquid, and this is the volume of vapor. So I can replace these two terms by the volume here, the volume per per uh, uh, per particle. And then if we suppose that we have an ideal gas, so remember we have a gas in equilibrium with liquids. If we have an ideal gas, I can uh, replace, uh, I, can, I, can, I can change uh, the, the vapor, the volume of vapor by the ideal gas flow, which is RT, over p okay uh, and of course we have been able to change the to change from the lowercase v into the uh, uppercase v since we are working for a mole that's what the r here probably should remind you that we're working on the molar level so that's a vo molar volume very good so from there of course we can integrate this function pretty easily to find that the pressure so the pressure in the vapor is going to increase exponentially as a function of the volume of the liquid, the change that we do in the liquid, the pressure in the liquid, and of course, uh, and there is also a temperature uh, variation. P0 is uh, essentially the, the pressure that you have when before you apply an increase in pressure to the liquid. So remember what we are trying to solve here. We have a liquid in equilibrium with vapor, and we are increasing the pressure in the liquid and we are wondering what's happening okay and so what we found is that the pressure uh, in in the, in the vapor will actually change like this like this like this equation here so of course that means that when delta p liquid so when there's no uh, external change to the pressure to the liquid when it is zero p0 is equal to p and in fact uh, this is called the vapor pressure the vapor pressure is, is, by definition, is the pressure of a vapor in equilibrium the liquid without excess pressure applied. So this is P equal P0. Basically, the vapor pressure is P0. Vapor pressure is that pressure uh, uh, of a vapor in equilibrium with a liquid. Okay, so that's, that's, the defini that's, that's a definition. Good. Now, here's the thing, though. Uh, because delta P liquid is the extra pressure applied to the liquid and P0 is the vapor pressure of the gas, what is delta P liquid? Well, think a little bit about the situation. We have a gas at a given pressure and then you want it to condense. But it turns out that the very first phase of condensation, and so that's really what I mean by fluctuations I discussed before and I will discuss more later, uh, the first thing that's going to form is a, is a droplet. Right, is a, is a droplet that we have discussed in, uh, in, in lecture 17, so a long time ago. And in fact, we calculated the pressure of the droplet. So you may have wondered why we calculated that uh, 12 lectures ago. Well, the reason is that we calculated the, the, the fact there is an additional pressure in a droplet because it's a droplet. And that pressure came directly for the surface tension gamma. But more importantly, we find that the, the, the pressure, uh, uh, pressure the, the liquid pressure, uh, uh, the pressure of the liquid is in the droplet is inversely proportional to the radius. So if you have a very small droplet, the additional pressure that you, you have is huge. It's humongous. So that means that uh, if the pressure is very large, that means that there is a tendency for the droplet to 
evaporate, right? The pressure is large, therefore the droplets try to evaporate, when, especially when they are tiny, okay? So that means that thermodynamically, the system, and, and I, can, I can, of course, replace this here, but what, what, what that means is that um, when you have a very, very small uh, droplet, the droplet, the pressure that's going to be related is going to be huge. And so this is very important. This is called Kelvin's formula for the pressure of, of in the vapor that's in contact with the droplet of, 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 radius, of radius of curvature R and surface tension gamma. So let's try to let's try to see a little bit what are the consequences. I started to discuss them, but let's try to discuss them in more detail from this. So a small droplet is a very high vapor pressure, right? Vapor pressure of the vapor with, with contact to a droplet of radius r is given here. It's very, very large because r is very small. That means that the vapor, even though thermodynamically should condense, it will not because it will not condense because the, the droplet, yes, indeed, will start to nucleate. In other words, there will be a phase transition, but the vapor, the pressure is so high that the droplet would rather evaporate. So in other words, bring, uh, have a, a super cooled vapor, just like we discussed before. And so the thermodynamics tells you, no, it should not happen, but if you will, the kinetics and the detail of the phase transition uh, uh, forces uh, the, the droplet to evaporate. And so you end up in a situation, even though it's metastable and is short-lived most of the time, in a situation where you actually create a phase that is not the phase that, uh, with the lowest chemical potential, just because of those fluctuations, those, those behavior that are happening right there during the phase transition. Okay, so this is something that's happening here. So it turns out that this is, a, this is something that happens a lot in the atmosphere. And, uh, uh, and for example, with rain. And what happens is that you, you, in order to stabilize those droplets, usually the droplets will nucleate uh, around small uh, uh, dust and other, other uh, small particles. And so this nucleation will actually allow uh, to to reduce this this pressure of in the droplets and therefore create uh, basically create rain. So um, so so that that means in other words that you could have uh, you you can create those situation where you have super cooled water. So that's that's why basically we explain that there is a metastable situation right around the the phase transition where for a short amount of time, the thermodynamically, the, 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 the phase that's not thermodynamically the most stable will actually exist simply because of the mechanism that is required to do otherwise. Um, so just basically there is a barrier, if you will, for the full uh, condensation to take place. And that barrier in this case is this very high pressure due to the fact that the droplets are very small radius, uh, have a very small radius to start with. So in fact, you have uh, the same thing for the superheated liquid. So remember you have a liquid, you heat it up and uh, you can heat it up above the boiling temperature and it's not gonna create, uh, it's going to stay a liquid. Again, it's a metastable situation. Uh, it's gonna stay a liquid and it's not uh, going to, uh, to form a, a vapor right away, okay? Uh, so you can actually create things like this. And, and, and this is this, this thing when you do, when you, for example, boil water, uh, there will be small droplet that's going to start uh, initially, uh, but only the large uh, bubbles are going to survive because the small the bubbles have a very high, have a very high pressure. Now, What's interesting about this, and I'm not going it into as much detail, and the result is actually obtained, is actually given by this equation here. Uh, what's very important in this is that this is actually being used a lot by physicists, this idea of a superheated liquid. And in fact, if you do a superheated liquid uh, inside, a, inside a cavity, uh, you can create, you can find, um, so you are in a superheated uh, situation, and then you 
co what you create what's called a bubble chamber. And in fact, you can um, see the path of particles, in fact, uh, subatomic particles, as they move through such a superheated liquid, because as they move through it, they allow for uh, the creation of bubbles, if you will. Uh, so in other words, the creation, the, the, you move from a liquid to a vapor that creates the bubbles into the superheated liquid, and then you can measure the, those, those, uh, those paths. Uh, so you can look at the different properties like like charges and, and things like that, depending on the on the, the trajectory of the, of the particles. So the particles basically here serve as a nucleation center uh, for uh, for the liquid to form to 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 move uh, to, to create bubbles. Let's try to to go a little bit further here. So so far we've discussed about the latent heat that was very often required to move from one phase to another once we had heated up uh, one phase uh, high enough uh, to reach to this point of, of equilibrium between two phases, for example, liquid and gas. And so it turns out uh, uh, we can also do this uh, for um, when we have more than one component in the system. So component is actually uh, called a chemically independent constituent of the system. So if we have more than one component, we can also look at the phase. So usually what we do in that case, and this is something that we've already done when we looked at the os at osmosis, we introduce the mole fraction, xi, which is basically the number of mole of the component i with respect to the total number of mole in the system. Of course, the sum over i of xi is equal to one, because of course, if we add all the moles of the, all the, the, the mole and we divide by the number of mole, we get one, obviously. Uh, so we can have each component as can be in different phases. And so the question is we have is how many degrees of freedom do I actually have in that problem? So think about uh, you, you are taking a container, you're adding different types of particles, and those particles can be in different phases. Now the question you ask yourself is how many degrees of freedom do I have? So how many degrees, how many degrees of freedom do I have to determine to completely determine the thermodynamics of the problem? So let's do this. So let's suppose the degree of freedom is F, and suppose that we have, so we have P different phases and C component. So let's, let's calculate it. We have, uh, in order to describe our system, we usually we work in the PT uh, uh, plane. So we have two intensive variables, T and P, but we also have the mole fractions. So we need the XI, right? We need to know how much of one uh, system versus two, uh, one, one, one particle type of particle versus another type of particle we have. So we need the xi. Well, you could think that we need, we therefore need c component, right? Because we have c, we have we have c component, therefore we need c value. Of course, because the sum of xi is equal to one, uh, you have a constraint, so you don't need to know all the xi. All you need to know is to know c minus one of them, because automatically the last one is is determined. By due to the due to this to this normalization, so we basically have the total number of variable is uh, uh, of course uh, given by two because it's temperature and pressure, and we have c minus one uh, mole fraction for each uh, phase. So in other words, we have two times plus p c minus one. However. There are a number of constraints. This is not the number, the total number of degrees of freedom. Some of the degrees of freedoms are imposed by the fact that we know the others. In fact, we have uh, the equations are that we need to have that the chemical potential of each of the different phases of each of different components have to be the same. Okay, so we need uh, so we, if we have p phases. We need for for the for the component i all the chemical potential have to be the same uh, at the phase transition, and also uh, we have for, we of course have that for each component. So in other words, um, so in other words, we have c times p minus one equation to solve in here. The minus one here has nothing to do with what the minus one here. The minus one is the fact that if I have p phases, I have p minus one equations. Like for example, if you have only two phases, you only have one equation. 
Anyways, these are equations. So an equation means that you can find a variable as a function of the other, another one. So the total number of degrees of freedom is reduced by this. So the number of degrees of freedom will be this term, 2 plus p times c minus 1 minus c times p minus 1, which gives me this important result, which is the Gibbs phase rule, that tells me that the number of degrees of freedom is the number of components minus the number of phases plus 2. So these are basically the number of, of you know, the type of information that I need to describe my phase transitions. Let's have a look at, uh, at an example. For example, if we have only one component and we've, discuss, we've discussed this before. So this is the Gibbs rule here. Uh, one component C equal one. So I end up with number of degrees of radiance three minus P, B, P being the phases. So if I have only one phase, Okay, we are only, we're only working with one phase. Uh, the number of degrees of freedom F is equal, is equal to two. In other words, uh, the two degrees of freedom is the, uh, is the entire PT plane, right? We have two, two, two uh, variables that I can vary continuously. I, there's nothing that imposes what the values should be. If I have two phases now, so two phases means, for example, between the liquid and the gas, or between the liquid and the solid, then F becomes one. 3 minus 2, so 1. So that if there is only one degree of freedom, you know what it means. In, a, in such a plane, it corresponds to a line, right? A line is always a one degree of freedom kind of, of geometric object. Uh, so that means that we have these lines. These are the, the lines that correspond to the, um, the boundary between two uh, phases. So we have two phases, uh, uh, so we have one degree of freedom here. And of course, if I have three phases at the same time, P equal three, F is equal to zero. So if I have zero degrees of freedom, that means that I have a single point. So the dimensionality zero, if you want, that's, that's the degrees of freedom also gives you dimensionality, if you will. So F is equal to zero, and the three phases can only coexist at a, at a, at a given point, which is, of course, called the triple point uh, in, in, uh, in thermodynamics. We can do the same thing if we have two, uh, two components. Of course, things get a little bit more complicated and a little bit more difficult to represent. So in that case, uh, we get four minus P. Uh, usually in that case, uh, we have to force another one. We need to force another variable in order to be able to plot things. Otherwise we have to plot them in three dimension. It's not always easy. So imagine that we fix the pressure. So we work at a given pressure. So we impose one degrees of freedom, we constrain it. So that means that what we really have is three minus P. Right, so we have the three minus p, and the variables we have now, the temperature and the mole fraction of the of of the first component, or the second component. You pick the one you want. The point is that if you know one of them, you know the other ones. Is x one plus x two is equal to one. Good. So if we have two components, we we have if we have only one phase, so p equal one. So I end up with uh, f is equal to. Uh, so the number of degrees of freedom is two. So we can pick uh, any, uh, so we have two, uh, we have the, 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 the geometric uh, domain uh, that's available to such a system is two dimensional. And so we can take any value X1 uh, T. If we have two phases, uh, now the number of degrees of freedom is only one. Um, so there is only one line co of coexistence of temperature and uh, mole fraction, and of course, if we have three phases, uh, they only exist at one point. And we can only do this by imposing a number of constraints. Uh, one more thing I'd like to discuss before we move on to more general uh, descriptions of, of the phase transition is the entropy of mixture. And this is called the colligative properties. Colligative means that we are a collection of things that are put together. Um, okay. Uh, if you, if, and again, we discussed this quite a bit in, 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 when we spoke about osmosis. If we add a small quantity of solute to a solvent, we automatically increase the entropy a lot. And this is something that's pretty intuitive. If you add a, a little bit of salt in, in, in water, let's say, the number of microstates that you get increases significantly. So if you increase the number of microstates, the entropy increases, okay? So if you do that in a liquid, 
it turns out that you are decreasing the tendency to form a gas compared to what it was without the, the, the solute, without the salt. And the reason for this is because one of the reasons why a liquid would form a gas is because it increases the entropy, right? This is, this is the arrow of time, if you want. This is, this is second law of thermodynamics. However, if you have artificially increased the entropy already by adding uh, salt, for example, or solute into the liquid, then that means that you are basically gaining time, if you will. In other words, you need to go, you need to uh, fight the fact that you already increased the entropy, right? Because before you were increasing the entropy by the, just by the process of having a phase change. But you already increased the entropy by adding a, solvent, a solute in the solvent, Therefore, you need to go to higher temperature to get uh, to, to, to go to the phase transition. So therefore, the boiling point increases if you add a small amount of solute. And you have the same effect uh, when you try to, to uh, for the freezing temperature. So for example, uh, for liquid, if you, uh, if you increase the entropy in, in a liquid, and again, by adding uh, salt in the liquid, it will be uh, more difficult for it to freeze. So we'll have to go to lower, to lower temperature. And uh, uh, simply because the, the entropy is, is much larger. So therefore that phase is stabilized, if you will. And of course, uh, these things can be, uh, um, there are definitions again in thermodynamics as often in thermodynamics, there are so many parameters that have been described. You can in fact, uh, calculate those changes in, in, in boiling temperature or freezing temperature uh, using what's called an ebullioscopic constant or cryoscopic constant that are material dependent. But the point remains that this is a purely entropic effect. And you know, of course, that uh, that's, that's for those uh, who live in the Northeast or live where there is a lot of snow, uh, this is a very important thing here because of course, uh, we use salt to uh, so that the snow, um, uh, the, the the freezing temperature goes down. So that means that uh, snow remains a liquid longer uh, because we salt, and which is of course a very important thing. Of course, most probably each time you drive on the snow, you don't think about the fact that it's an entropic effect, the fact that it's actually uh, not uh, snow but it's liquid. But maybe now you will you will drive differently when you think about this. Okay, so we've done quite a bit of work. Uh, now we are going to uh, study a, a little bit more how we classify the different phase transitions. We've spent a lot of time to look into the phase transition between uh, liquid and gas, and we also spoke a little bit of the phase transition between a liquid and a solid. But there are other types of phase transitions, magnetic transitions and, and otherwise, uh, superconducting state transition and all sort of transition, uh, phase transitions when, when uh, when a particular uh, uh, phase of matter changes its phases uh, due to a change of external conditions like pressure, temperature, magnetic field, and things like that. So it's, it's a good idea to try to, to understand a little bit how we can classify this. Um, the first classification I'm going to give you, which is the uh, Paul Arendt-Fest uh, uh, classification, is still uh, used. Uh, it, its definition has been modified over the years, but uh, the general principles uh, re remain the same. So this is one of the places where we, one of the places, sorry, when we actually um, use a lot of knowledge from previous chapters. So I'm, I put it here on the right hand side of this on this slide. Uh, these are equations that we already used quite a couple of times today, where we saw that the entropy is related to the the, to the uh, minus the derivative of the Gibbs function with respect to temperature. Volume is the derivative of the Gibbs function with respect to pressure. We also studied that the latent heat is related to a change in, in, uh, uh, in, in entropy. And of course, we also saw that the heat capacity, for example, a constant volume, but any heat capacity is related to a change in entropy itself. So basically the heat capacity is related to the second derivative here the second derivative of the Gibbs function, right? Uh, so, okay, good. So the Arendt-Fest uh, Arendt proposed a classification of phase transition as follows. He, he, he came up with the idea of having phase transition of first order, second order, third order, and so on and so forth. And the order 
of the phase transition, for example, a, a first order phase transition, is the low is the order of the lowest differential of the Gibbs function or the chemical potential, as you know, because they are related, that have a discontinuity at the at the critical point. So let's try to. We are going to see example to examples to 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 illustrate this definition, but let's try to look on the right hand side here. So, for example, if the entropy is discontinuous at the phase transition, as it, as it is, for example, from a, when we go from a liquid to a gas, it's discontinuous. That means the first derivative of the Gibbs function is discontinuous. Therefore, the first order, the, uh, the referential is discontinuous. Therefore, it's a first order phase transition. That's the idea here. Now imagine that this term was would not uh, were would be continuous. Let's suppose that the entropy is continuous at the at the critical uh, temperature. It's for different type of phase transition, but the heat capacity is not. So the heat capacity is discontinuous. In other words, the second derivative of the Gibbs function is discontinuous. Therefore, a, such a case will be a second order uh, phase transition. So first order transition must involve a latent heat. Okay, so let's try to understand why. As I mentioned, if it's if it's a first order transition, that means that the first derivative of the of the Gibbs function is discontinuous. Therefore, the entropy is discontinuous. If the entropy is discontinuous, that means the delta s, so s two minus s one, is a finite number. Therefore, there is a latent heat. So each time you need a latent heat to move. Uh, from one phase to the other, you have a first order uh, phase transition. So that's the idea. Uh, interestingly enough, the volume is also a first derivative. So if you have a jump in volume, when you move from one phase to the other, you also have uh, a first order. And again, this idea of, of uh, uh, discontinuous change of volume is what we see in, in, in for example, in liquid to, to gas uh, trans uh, transition. And as I mentioned a second ago, the heat capacity is the second differential. So, in a fir for a first order uh, for a first order transition, uh, because the entropy is has a discontinuity, that means the derivative of discontinuity is a spike. So that will be a short spike. Uh, the, another another second uh, uh, second uh, order differential is the compressibility, since it's a derivative of the volume. Uh, with respect to to, to 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 temperature, so uh, so that's everything that we've we've done so far. Really, is was all they were all first order phase transitions and everything we've done in the screen class. So we can we we typically plot this this way. So the Gibbs function uh, itself uh, is continuous, but the derivative is not. Right, this is just a, this is a change. So remember, we've seen this also for. Uh, for the chemical potential, remember the Gibbs function and the chemi chemical potential are very much related, uh, since the the chemical potential is the Gibbs function per uh, particle. Uh, the volume actually changes discontinuously, the the entropy changes discontinuously, and the derivative of the entropy, which is proportional to the heat capacity, has a spike. So the spike is basically the derivative of a discontinuity. On the other hand, if you have a second order you see that the, the derivative of the Gibbs function is continuous. The, the volume has, does not have a discontinuity, right? The volume is the derivative of this, of this plot here. Uh, so the volume, uh, but the derivative of the volume can be discontinuous. And if it is discontinuous, that means that the derivative, uh, uh, the second derivative will be, will, uh, if, if the first, der sorry, if the first derivative of the volume is discontinuous, just like here, then there will be, that means that, that it's going to be reflected in the heat capacity, uh, for example. So if the heat capacity, which is a second order derivative of the Gibbs function, is discontinuous, then it's a second order phase transition. So this is as simple as that, okay? This is as simple as that. So we've, we've studied a lot of first order uh, phase transition. Um, there are other uh, uh, phase transition. For example, in a ferromagnetic system, uh, there is no latent heat. So that means that the Gibbs function is continuous and its derivative is continuous. This is a second order. Uh, 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 this is a second order differential. So um, 
so we will see um, um, we'll see that uh, this this uh, this mag in the magnetic system the magnetization being uh, be, being continuous uh, so it does not change discontinuously at the at the critical temperature means that we have there a second order uh, transition. Now let's go back to the to what we discussed before about the effect of fluctuation. What happens actually during the phase transition? And we've discussed this um, uh, already when we discussed about the droplet. The effect of the droplet was really weird because thermodynamically, you should have a droplet forming. But in reality, there isn't, the droplet will tend to evaporate because of the high pressure due to the surface tension and the small radius that you have in the droplet. So we understand the physics, but it seems to violate thermodynamics. But it, the reason why it violates thermodynamics is because it does not. <laughs> uh, remember the constraint we had to start with. We were always working in the thermodynamic limit, where the number of particles involved is so large that uh, we can use averages to describe things. And it always works, unless it doesn't, of course. And this is where uh, the fluctuations start to matter. Remember the, uh, the image we use for the rain dropping on on a roof, on a flat roof, the very first lecture we had. And we see that the fluctuation do, do not matter as much when we have a large roof and you have steady rain. But when you have only a few drop of rain, uh, you start to feel the fluctuations start to matter a lot. And this is exactly what's happening, uh, could happen at the phase transition. The phase transition, you start to have only a very small number of particles that are involved in the phase transition. And so at that point, all the we can have fluctuations, and the fluctuation means that we are not um, in we are not in the in the conditions where the thermodynamics properties can can be applied. Now, when we have more and more particles that are involved, uh, we end up back to the thermodynamics prediction. But during fluctuations, we do have very we do have actually. Um, we do we do have departure from what thermodynamics uh, properties can 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 take place. So there's a reason why they, they, there are things that can happen during phase transition that are out of equilibrium. I would say. So this 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 idea of a thermodynamic limit uh, breaks down, and uh, the fluctuation are particularly important at the phase transition since you have the, a few particles that start to be involved in the phase transition before we actually have the entire system uh, changing. So this is something that, that you see when you boil water or even more when you boil milk because this, the effect is usually more, even more dramatic. Um, when you heat up the, the water, the water, uh, it's, it's pretty quiet. I mean, it does not make much noise. But when we get very close to the boiling point, you start to have a lot of noise. And the reason why you have noise and, and, and a violent outburst of the bubbles is because you are there, you have fluctuations. So some local effects happen that are not in equilibrium with the rest of the of, of the of the system of the of the body of water basically that's the idea so all this uh, uh, led people to to come up with a with a variation uh, of the analysis of the iron fest uh, classification and so right now the the the, the classification of iron fest in first order second order so on and so forth has changed quite a bit and now uh, basically uh, the definition of a first order transition, first order phase transition is still the same. This is the one that needs, a, that requires a latent heat, okay? And all the other phase transition uh, 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 are now uh, uh, discussed as being uh, continuous phase transition. And those continuous phase transition are all the, the higher order phase transition. So this is how we, we describe these. Now, there is another point of view that we can use to describe phase transition, and this is related to symmetry breaking. And this one is a little bit of a subtle point, so I'm going to try to explain this. So on the right-hand side, on the top, we have a liquid, and on the bottom, we have a solid. And now, you have to think a lot about this over time. So you imagine that this is actually evolving uh, during a certain time, okay? Uh, and Okay, so take that into account. Do not just look at this as being snapshots. Look at this as being uh, just, uh, I mean, just these are snapshots, but do not just consider this snapshot. Consider that this is a dynamical uh, effect. So what happens is that is the level of symmetry. It turns out 
it turns out that the liquid has much more symmetry than the solid. I know this looks like uh, something that's a little bit unusual, you would say the other way, but think about it. Uh, let's try to think a little bit about the solid first. We are at low temperature. These atoms are certainly moving about a little bit, right? You have at least the equipartition theorem just, just for that reason. But let's try to think about this, okay? So we have a symmetry. For example, here we have a four-fold symmetry. We have, we have a different planes and so on and so forth. So we have quite a few symmetries. But that's fine. But the atoms are not moving much, and we have those symmetries. So we consider this to be high symmetry. But it turns out that if you consider the average positions of the molecules in, in a liquid like this one, we actually have all the symmetries. There is no preferred direction. There is, we can rotate the things around any axis or translate it. On average, you will find the same system. In other words, the number of symmetries in a dynamical system like a liquid here, the symmetries are much larger than that in a, in a solid. So in fact, it's because there is a freezing of the positions and it's again a dy dynamical effect. Because of the freezing of the position, we do lose symmetries. Of course, we see the symmetries that are retained more clearly. We see the two-fold axis, the four-fold axis, and so on and so forth. But in fact, we are losing symmetry compared to the situation with the liquid. So I hope this is clear. So the point is, we could actually look, and this is the text I just, there is quite a bit of text on those slides, but this is basically the summary of what I, I just said. We can look um, at this and uh, as, as being a sign of phase transition, okay? And it turns out that a symmetry exists or does not exist. We can't say, I almost have a fourfold symmetry. Or no, we either have a symmetry or we don't. So that means that here we have a very clear fact that during the phase change, okay, there is no, there is a clear discontinuous change in symmetry, okay. So this discontinuous change of symmetry is another way to look at the phase transition. So this is very important. That means that uh, that that if we find a sudden change in symmetry, that may that may. Um, correspond to a phase transition. I should say though that this, the problem is not, is, is not necessarily simple because not all phase transition involve a change of symmetry. Indeed, if I work above the critical point in this region, we can actually move from uh, the gas to a liquid without going through this, this change uh, of, of symmetry here. And in fact, it's, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, now, if we consider the transition from a liquid to a solid, um, there is no critical point. In that case, there is always a change in symmetry between the liquid and the solid. And therefore, you can consider that the phase transition happens when the symmetries, some symmetries are broken moving from the solid to the liquid. And I, again, I'd like to insist that the symmetries is not the symmetries of a snapshot of the structure, but the symmetries of the time average positions. A uh, couple of more things that we can say about the symmetry now that we are thinking a little bit about the symmetries in a slightly different way. Uh, we can understand other phase transition, uh, just for example, the, for example, the transition between the ferromagnetic and the paramagnetic states uh, are also uh, related to, to a breaking of the symmetry. Uh, a breaking of the symmetry in a superconducting state uh, also, is also related to, to, to a phase transition. Now, I've, I've alluded to ferromagnetism and paramagnetic states quite a, quite a couple of times in this screencast, and we will discuss this much more in the second part of the screencast uh, that will be a, a separate recording when I will talk about the icing model. But uh, this, is, this is a phase transition we will study in great detail. One more thing i like to say before getting to the summary slide is that this idea of breaking the symmetry is actually fundamental to physics. Uh, when, in fact, when the temperature, and we can actually see that the outset of some physical phenomena, physical laws, come from the breaking of symmetry. And this is what people do uh, in particle physics, in theoretical particle physics in particular, where this breaking of symmetry uh, uh, lead to, the, to, to a new, to a phase transition, so to speak, 
uh, it's not really a phase transition, but this idea, uh, well, it's not a phase transition in the same way as we discussed in this, in this slide, but it's in this uh, lecture. But this is a phase transition where we start to have a physical phenomena, a physical law that actually uh, uh, show up. So, for example, at the very early universe, the temperature was extremely high, as we discussed before. And that means that uh, the, and there were uh, much higher symmetry. And then as the temperature went down, you started to have symmetry that were broken, just the same way as when we go from a liquid to a solid. And uh, there was a number of phase transition to, uh, to a number of mechanisms that were allowed by the fact that you broke that, those symmetry uh, that were essentially the maximal uh, symmetry you had. So this is how you, you understand the transition uh, between the way that we describe the, the physics uh, as a function of temperature, simply because uh, the fact that you have a reduced symmetry means that you have phenomena that start to take their own branches uh, like, uh, like in the different uh, unification of the forces, for example, in physics. So it's time now to move to the summary slide. We've, we've done a lot of things in this in class, and they were, it, uh, it borrowed a lot of information and knowledge that we, ha that we uh, acquired in, the, in previous lectures. So I hope that uh, you have been able to, to put everything together and understand <clears throat> these phase transitions a number of things that were important that we learned is that um, when there is a latent heat, so when you have to add uh, additional heat to move from a solid from 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 a phase to another phase, even though you are already at the right temperature, I would say this is going to be a first order phase transition because that latent heat corresponds to um, uh, a discontinuous change in entropy. Uh, we studied the those the phase, those phases for example if we look at the at the phase plane fa the phase uh, if we put the phase on the pressure versus temperature plane um, we we could actually understand this boundary between a liquid and a and a gas for example where we could we did also that for other other phase changes in phase this uh, and then this came from closest clapeyron we were able to to write how how the this this uh, boundary between the two phases can be can be uh, can be obtained, uh, we we actually looked at a an, an specific case where we actually get into a superheated vapor, and a superheated vapor should not be the thermodynamically most stable case, uh, but for example, uh, when you compare this to the high pressure that's needed to form a small droplet, you, it, it appears that there is a tendency for the droplets to evaporate and therefore to create a supercooled uh, a supercooled uh, uh, vapor. Uh, we discussed the Gibbs phase rules that allow us to calculate the number of degrees of freedom as a function of component number of phases, uh, and with the idea that the pressure and temperature are the variable that we that we use in this in this context. Uh, we also discussed uh, Aaron Fest. Uh, um, classification of phase uh, transition. And I spent a bit of time talking about symmetry without going too much into the mathematical details of this, but more about the idea of this, of considering the symmetry of the, the time average, uh, the, the, so the position, uh, considering the fluctuations and the, and the fact that uh, the things are, are moving about. So this is a, this is a fairly uh, difficult screencast, fairly difficult material. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, it will become even. Uh, it will be clarified further from from your understanding by uh, uh, with the second part of this screencast, which will be on on studying the Ising model, which is a very good example of a, of a system with a phase transition. Thank you very much.